Sorry, let me introduce our next uh, speaker. It's uh, Denley Hannah from Redland University, and he will speak about uh, cubical time theory. So, continuing the uh, um, the general line of the previous talk. So, thank you. Okay, thanks. And thank you for having me. Um, so, this talk is really about the same thing as the previous talk, because there'll be a lot of overlap, as we'll see. Um, the general goal here is to figure out how to program in homotopy type theory. So, we want to treat homotopy type theory as a programming language. Thierry showed an example like this one, and I think it was exactly this one, where you have some algebraic structure, and then if you have two isomorphic types, you can transport between it um, between them. There's another example, like we had a paper at ICFP, I'm thinking about patch theories as they come up in version control systems as higher inductive types, and where the paths model patches. And then if you want to write any programs with this, well, you need a computational interpretation of univalence, higher inductive types, things like that. Later this afternoon, Guillaume will talk about an example in doing homotopy theory and homotopy type theory where we can give a proof that there exists a K such that some homotopy group is equal to Z mod K, and if we could actually run that proof with a constructive interpretation, then like out would pop two, we hope, and then fill us <laughs> yeah. Right, okay, so there's lots of motivating examples there. And what I want is really to see homotopy type theory as a programming language where we have a type system and a decidable definitional equality on open terms and an operational semantics on closed terms. And I want it all to look like type theory and be the kind of thing that I can explain to a programming languages person and say, you know, this is what the system is, this is how it works. So the basic idea in all of this is starting from this idea that types are groupoids of some sort, and so we have operations of identity and inverses and composition. We have unit laws, we have inverse laws, we have associativity, we have, you know, all the higher stuff that then follows that. And somehow we need to effectively define these operations. <coughs> and so, well, Terry already went over this, but we sort of reformulate these operations. So if you think about a groupoid, a groupoid has identity, inverses, and compositions. We can reformulate that as identities plus one ternary operation that looks like that. So when you have uh, three <coughs> paths kind of like that, then you want to sort of compute a missing side there. And if you take P to be the identity, then you get Q compose R as the bottom, and if you take Q and R to be the uh, identity, then you get P inverse as the bottom, right? So this gives you the same operations as a group. So there's this idea of even a U shape like that, we want to figure out the missing side. And the idea is that we need to do this in every type. So if my type happens to be a pair type, that is I have uh, a pair of paths in A cross A prime, then the problem I have to solve is, given a U like that in A cross A prime, I need to come up with the <coughs> bottom of that U. But in a pair type, everything's a pair, is kind of the intuition. So that if I have a U like that, then I have a U in A on the one hand, which I can fill, and then a U in A prime on the other hand, which I can fill, and then my answer is sort of, put back together the fillers over in A and over in A prime. So I'm sort of decomposing this filler operation based on the type in order to say, well, we do it over here, we do it over there. Okay, and now the motivation for these con operations is one of the types I have to consider is the identity type itself. So here I'm looking at a filler in a type of paths or morphisms or something like that which means that my left-hand side, L there, is really, so like, what is a path from P to Q, where P and Q are both themselves paths? I think of that as a square, where I have reflexivity on one side, reflexivity on the other. And then, on the top, I'll have a square from P to U, and then a square from U to V. And so really, the data I have when I go to define the filler in the identity type is not three lines anymore, but three squares. So then I want to fit these three squares onto those sides of a cube, like that. And then if I could fill that cube, then I'd be done filling in the identity type. 
And one way to do it is you sort of put reflexivities on the top of the bottom of the cube, and then compute the missing side of the cube. So we went from, I need a missing side of a box to I need a missing side of a cube because of the identity type. And then that's what I put there, because now I have an appropriate square to fit onto the missing side of the U bit. Okay, so somehow, if we go to define this missing side of a U operation to get the induction to go through to figure out how to do the identity type, well, suddenly we're at missing sides of boxes. So this is the motivation for the con condition, which says that any n-dimensional open box has a lid and an inside. <laughs> so somehow we need to come up with these filler operations in arbitrary dimensions. And for that, we need to explore a notation for arbitrary n-dimensional cubes. And uh, so there's, of course, the work that Terry was just talking about from you know, last year up until now. And this work uh, was something that Guillaume and I, and so this is joint work with Guillaume Brunery, and Guillaume and I started working on this during the spring of the IAS year with Carlo and Billy and Bob Harper, and we were trying different shapes of things. So there's like many, many different failed attempts at higher dimensional type theory that sort of were a prelude to this work. And there was, we tried sort of globular things for a while, and then over the last, since I guess about, when was the moment? That was like in January of this year or so, we've been trying various cubicle things. And I think, uh, it's basically, what I want to do is sort of take the constructive model that Thierry was talking about in the previous talk and pull that syntax back into type theory. Because I don't want to have to sort of talk in terms of some other thing. I want the type theory to directly describe the object <coughs> that the computation is about. And so this work started as sort of a type theoretic paraphrase of the ideas in their work on a cubicle model. And I think, fortunately, we've sort of ended up in the same place as where uh, Thierry was talking about in the previous talk, in the sense that a lot of the notation that I'll be talking about now is sort of isomorphic to some of the things that he was writing in the previous talk. So I think we've converged a little bit, which is good and somewhat reassuring. So, let's go. When we're designing a cubicle type theory, there are a bunch of choices in terms of how we set it up. So one option is you sort of have a parameterized judgment of some sort that says that U is an N cube in A for some notion of N and you know what it means to be a cube in A. Another approach is sort of the internal inductive step approach that we heard about yesterday in Ambrose and Torsten's talk where you define the identity type in terms of other types that exist. So these are sort of branching points in the space of cubicle type theories, I would say. Another question is boundaries as terms or boundaries as types. So boundaries as terms, by that I mean, you say that U is a square in A, means that U comes with, so think of a square, right? So it's saying that U comes with the lines on the outside of it and the points on those lines and things like that, which we might contrast with an approach that I would call boundaries as types, where you would say U is a square in A, whose boundary is left, right, top, bottom, okay? So it's a question of whether the boundary is part of the classifier or part of the program or the term itself. And we've explored different things in this space. Um, another question, which is mainly just a technical question, is sort of whether the cubicle operations are a meta operation, that is, are they things that are defined, so think of like substitution in lambda calculus, it's a defined operation, this crawls over the syntax of the term and computes a new term, or are they internalized as an explicit substitution, I'll up here again, where you have a notation for the substitution that's an explicit term format. So in this work, it's a infinite dimensional boundaries as terms, and for now, I would say it's explicit cubicle operations, but I think, as you'll see, the cubicle operation is really the kind of thing that looks like a, something that could be made a meta operation, that we haven't tried doing that in technical detail yet. But big picture approach is, we're gonna have a judgment for an n cube and a type, and we're going to have the boundaries coming with the elements of the type, rather than being something that's sort of in the classifier. The approach where we have the boundaries in the classifier has been kind of tantalizing, and we've tried many things along those lines, but it always sort of 
peters out somewhere and gets rather complicated and doesn't quite work out. Okay, so there's this idea of dimensions as names where an n-dimensional cube has n-dimension names free and then the properties that you would expect from variables like alpha equivalence or substitution, weakening, exchange, contraction correspond to operations on these cubes like renaming the dimensions of a cube or taking a face or doing a uh, reflexivity or a symmetry or a diagonal. But I don't think we need to take a nominal approach to this when we try to make a syntax on it. And in fact, I think we can treat the dimensions as pronouns rather than as nouns. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, a, you know, back and forth we've had with Andy uh, <laughs> work. Well, so my point is that, well, so to do nominal logic versus variables in like 30 seconds, right? So like basically nominal logic, the names are things. Like they are things that exist sort of independently of any scope. Whereas by pronoun, I mean a scoped reference to a particular binding site. And I think that the names we need to make a cubicle type theory are exactly implementing variable binding. And so we can treat them as variables and not as sort of unscoped, free-ranging name sort of things. So that's kind of what I was going for in this, in this presentation. So our basic judgments are going to be like this. So we want to have cubes of an arbitrary dimension. So we'll start with the notion of a dimension context, which you think of as variables representing uh, dimensions. And then our judgments of type theory, A is a type, or U is an element of A, will be parameterized by this context. So this is what Thierry was writing in the previous talk. I guess it would be the psi would be the thing that was sort of dangled on the bottom of the turnstile in the previous talk, which is saying how, what dimensions you're relative to. And this gives you a really nice notation for talking about different cubes and different elements of different cubes. Does the, dimen do the dimensions apply to gamma as well? Yes, the dimensions apply to the context <coughs> as well. So think of it as I mean, I think you could do this for any free sheet model. Like, you're basically, you're indexing the judgments of type theory by which element of the free sheet you're in. So, like, if you're in a particular uh, context here, then you're sort of saying you're in that element of the free sheet, rather than just talking about things that work for any free sheet. But just, yeah. just to be syntactically clear, the, the, yeah. the little s there is where you have some canonical collection of, of identity. Well, I mean, it's a bound yeah. variable. Right? I mean, it, in, like it's obeying the usual laws that we have for bound variables. So if you want to implement bound variables by de Brown form, then yeah, you sorry, can do my, my question is much yeah. lower. Oh, oh, yeah. Just the, the S, the S prime, the S. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Right. I mean, like S will behave just like an X in usual lambda yeah, gadgets. That's like, all it's just a variable. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so like the first thing is sort of just to get a feel for what the judgments are. When you have a judgment, that doesn't depend on any dimensions. That's like our usual notion of a point in a point. Well, okay, so our notion of a point in type is like our usual notion of a type. So nat colon type without any dimension variables is just saying nat is a type. And then an element of that is just a point of that type. So zero would be an element of nat, and that's just like its usual. What's, what's the right though? What? Oh, that's me drawing a point. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, now let me draw a line. <laughs> okay. So when you have a line in type, now this is like not going to be technically true for a little while, but let me just sort of give an intuition for it. You want to think about a line in type as two types, which are the endpoints of that line, together with an equivalence between them for your favorite definition of equivalence between types. Right, so like, I don't need to be too precise about what that is. And then an element of a line is going to be two heterogeneously equal points. Okay, so if you have an element of A, B, which are equal along E, that's going to be an element of A, an element of B, such that they're equal up to the equivalence E. And one way to render that is if you send a along E over to B, then that would be equal in B. That's sort of one way to do it. You can sort of formulate it the other way, but fine. 
And once again, this is just sort of for intuition. So the idea would be for <coughs> intuition. You want to think of it as, if x is a dimension, then, and I'm writing x, which we usually use as the lambda variable, but for a dimension, think of it as like the x-axis going this way. So this, we'll have some examples like that. So then, the triple ABE is a type. And if x is a dimension, then the triple ABP is an element of the line ABE. Okay? So the subtlety here is that we have lines as classifiers of other lines. Right? So we're going to have types of an arbitrary dimension <coughs> as classifiers of things of the same dimension. Okay, so now we need to talk about the ingredients that go into a cubicle type theory in this style. So the first is we need the cubicle operations. And rather than doing it in sort of a total substitution style, which is what Thierry was doing in the previous talk, uh, what we've been playing with is doing it in sort of a more single substitution style that looks like lambda calculus, where we'll have different variables, and then we'll just have substitution and weakening for those variables. So degeneracy, that is, making a point into a line, we'll see some examples in a second, or a line into a square, that's just weakening, introducing a variable s for a dimension that doesn't occur. Faces, or diagonals, are exactly the usual substitution operation, which says that if I have a variable s standing for a dimension, a thing to plug in for that variable, then I plug in all the way across the whole judgment and get a new thing. And this should satisfy exactly the usual things that you have for substitution, right? So if I do one substitution and then another, I can move the outer one inside as long as I hit it, hit the thing in the inner one with it, and if I have a variable that doesn't occur, then I should, when I substitute, I should not do anything. <coughs> okay, and then these R things are going to be S's, so variables, or 0 or 1. If we wanted to add connections, then we would have more things that we could plug in for variables here. So let's do some examples just to draw some pictures. If U is a term dependent on a dimension X, then I want to think of that as a line. What's the boundary of the line? Well, it's u with 0 for x and u with 1 for x. Okay? So this is boundaries as terms in the sense that terms u come with their boundaries. And this dimension substitution is the operation that lets you project out the boundary. How are 0 and 1 different? 0 and 1 are just things I can plug in for dimensions. So they're, I mean, it's like... It's like the primordial dimensions? Yeah. I mean, it's... Everything has a zero face and a one face, right? That's the idea. So if you have a square, right? So suppose I have a term dependent on two dimensions, then that should look like a square. And if I take x being zero, it's that face. X being one, it's that face. Y being zero, well, okay. So my y grows down just because that makes some of the diagrams easier. Y being zero is that face. And y being one is that face. Then I can also take the 0 for y of the 0 for x, the 0 for 1 for y of the 0 for x, the 0 for y of the 1 for x, etc., right, which gives me the corners of the square. And then that equation about substitution for independent variables commuting is what says that the 1 for x endpoint of the 0 for y line is the same as the 1 for x endpoint, it's a 0 for y endpoint of the 1 for x line, right? That is, that the two lines meet at the appropriate corner. Okay, so these equations on variables give you the cubical identities. And uh, you're allowing a substitution of y for x as well? Um, yes. Yeah, so we'll get to that in a second. Next, one more slide before that. Okay, so degeneracies, <coughs> if I have a point, A, then that determines a line, A. Well, that doesn't depend on the dimension x, so when I plug in 0 for x and 1 for x, I get A back. If I have a line, P, that determines a square, P, where if I plug in for y, right, the y, assume that P is a line in the x direction, because that's the way I'm drawing it, then I, when I plug in for y, it doesn't occur, and I get the same thing back. So what this says is that substitution 
after weakening is the identity, and in fact that otherwise pushes inside is full. Don't just ignore that. Okay, now, as Andy was just asking, so what do we get if we do take u with x for y with 0 for x? Well, that's the same as u with 0 for both x and y. So that's that side. What do I get if I do u with x for y with 1 for x? That's u with 1 for both of them. So that's that side. So u with x for y represents a line from that to that. So it's exactly the diagonal of the square. Okay? So that's the sense in which having uh, arbitrary substitutions of names that are not necessarily injective gives you lines. Okay. So that's kind of how we get our cubical identities going. Now we need higher dimensional substitution. So what is higher dimensional substitution? App, right, in homotopy type theory says, if you have a function from A to B, then that acts on paths and gives you something that goes from A0 equals A1 in A to uh, F of A0 equals F of A1, but that should be in B e there, right? Sorry. In the range. So a function takes points to points, lines to lines, squares to squares, etc. We want the idea that we can apply a function to something of any dimension. And we're going to implement this by a fancy substitution on open terms. Right? We want to say, when I have a term with a free variable, I can plug in something of an arbitrary dimension and get this higher dimensional substitution. So, in fact, the fancy substitution is not that much fancier than regular substitution. You take your regular substitution, so that's the rule you would think for substitution independent type theory. If I have x, and then I have an a that I can plug in for an x, then I plug it in across the whole context, and say that it works in any dimension. And that's kind of all there is to it. And then we'll ask that u with a for x is u when x doesn't occur, u with a for x, b for y, commutes in the usual way, and that u with a for x is going to interact with the dimension substitution in the same way, in the sense that the dimension substitution should swap inside the regular substitution in just the usual way. So that's kind of what we have going there. All right, so why does this give us a higher dimensional substitution? Well, suppose that u takes points to points. Right? So u is going to be something with an empty dimension context. It's going to take a variable w of type a to a term of type b. And now suppose that a is a y line, that is, it's something with y free. Well, I can degenerate u <coughs> the variable y. I can say that u is also something that takes lines to lines. And then I can do my substitution in order to say that what happens there is that, uh, like if I apply u to the a line, what I get is a term u with a for w. And then because of the equation on the previous slide, I know that the zero side of that is in fact the zero, u applied to the zero, well, u with the zero side of a substituted for w, and u with the one side of y substituted for w is the bottom point. Okay? So, because I have degeneracies, my regular notion of just plug something in, right, I can weaken first and then plug in, and that gives me my higher dimensional substitution, which allows me to lift something of, in one context, to a different context. Okay, so now we need to talk about some types. The rules for pi types. Basically, um, you just take the rules for pi types and sprinkle size everywhere and say the rules for pi's are the same in any dimension context. And then we'll have both beta and eta as definitional equality rules. Right? So this is just the usual beta reduction, eta expansion. And now this is going to sort of give us higher dimensional analogs of these things as we go. But right, so like it sort of means something new because we're going to interpret it at all levels. But it's really just the usual rule of lambda abstraction and application. And then, this is kind of a subtle point. So the way in which the dimension substitution 
interacts with the term constructors is sort of syntactically exactly what you would think to write, right? What happens when I substitute into an application? I substitute into the pieces. What happens when I substitute into a lambda? I substitute into the body. What happens when I substitute into a chi? Well, I substitute into this and I substitute into that. Okay. Say again. I'm sorry, I'm momentarily confused. Is, yeah. is your dimension substitution, is that just a massive theoretic operation? You're well, on the so for right now, since as I'll talk about later, I'm not even, like, we're not kind of done yet, so I don't know what all the terms of the language are. So for right now, I'm thinking of it as an internalized operation and these as definitional oh, qualities. Okay. But I think so far it looks just like a regular substitution. So I think it should be eventually be a regular substitution. But for right now, I just think of it as an internalized substitution and definitional qualities. What does internalized mean? So, I mean, that rather than, rather than it being an operation, so like when you present the syntax of the tech theory, you have a choice between saying there is an operation defined in the meta language that crawls over the syntax and does this, or you can say there's an explicit typing rule that gives you syntax constructor and typing rule for substitution, and then up to definitional equality you expand the operation. And there's kind of, it's like <coughs> technical between those two, like there's not really much of a difference between a meta operation or something that expands up to definitional equality. So, like, it doesn't really matter. Okay, yeah. So is the case of variables with your x? Yes. So, if you have, x with r for s, that is equal to x, okay? If you have, well, we haven't seen a spot where we would hit it yet, but if you had s with r for s, that would be equal to r. You really mean the first one. What? Yes, I really mean the first one. Yes, yes. No, this is, like, I screwed this up for until, like, yesterday. So, <laughs> yes. Here's why. Let me, let me explain why, okay? Okay. So the reason why, there, it's this bottom of the slide and then the next slide. So the dimension substitution applies horizontally to the whole judgment. So when you think about doing the substitution, you're changing the context and therefore the type of x. Okay? And I'm going to draw a picture on the next slide that will make that kind of make a little bit more sense. So suppose you have x colon a proves u colon b, that is, you have a term u, which is a function from lines to lines. Okay? Going back to the kind of doing things in triplicate intuition from yesterday's talk, right, where we think of a line as the top, the bottom, and the inside of the line between them, u is therefore something that takes lines like that to lines like that. So you might read it as it's something that takes a triple x0, x1, x underbar to x0, x1, x underbar. Okay? U. Uh, sorry, u0, u1, u underbar. But it's a special one of those. It's not just any function from triples to triples. It's ones where the first component here depends only on the first component here. The first, second component depends only on the second component. And the proof depends on all three things, okay? Which is to say, the top side of the line depends only on the top side of the input, the bottom side of the line depends only on the bottom side of the input, and then the line goes to the line, okay? And so this is sort of why it makes sense to define things this way, where if you look at a substitution for a dimension variable, then what you're gonna do is you're going to make a judgment here where x is going to be the boundary. So in the previous example, it would be like x is a with 0 for y proves u colon a with 0 for y, b with 0 for y, right? So if x colon a proves u colon b, with some dimension variable y in the context, then when you do the substitution, sorry, this should be u under the substitution zero for y, it's really about give me the 
top side of the line, I'll give you the top side of the line. So the variable in the context changes type, and therefore it makes sense to say the substitution into a variable is just that variable. Okay? So yeah. okay. it pins it down to be one, to be really yeah. kind of mathematically yes. right. Yeah. So right. right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So like you're like you're moving between, I mean the way Terry was writing it, like you're moving between different instances of the tree sheaf when you take this operation because then it's acting horizontally across the whole judgment, not just on the right hand side of the context. I mean, there are <coughs> other forms of substitution that you can consider, but you're not. So that's all right. Well, this is the one that seems to denote what I want to talk about. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you could, right? Like, among the many versions of this that I like less than the one I'm talking about today, there's one where we were thinking about, well, maybe the dimension substitution should act only on the right-hand side of the context, and then in here you would maintain gamma, and that would be like saying from a cube you can talk about both the left-hand side and the right-hand side in the same context. Yeah. But that seems wrong now. <laughs> So that was about, basically that was a justification for why these rules make sense then, right? Because if you think about type checking these, when you do the substitution into B, where B depends on A, what you need is something that depends on A with R for S, not just A. Okay, okay so we've got our pi types going. Now we need the identity type. And in this setting, I think it's very natural to take a heterogeneous identity type as primitive. So rather than having two equal elements, identity type meaning a path between two elements of the same type, the identity type is going to mean a path between two elements of two different types over a line in that type. Okay. So we'll have our formation rule that says that the type of subscript of the identity type is in a context with one extra dimension, right? So just pretend that psi is empty for the rest of this, then what it's saying is that it's the usual identity type rule, except that the type is really a line. So visualize it as the type in question is a line A between A's left endpoint and A's right endpoint. And then the subjects of the identity type, like the things you equate, will be a term A0 from capital A0 <coughs> and a term A1 from capital A1. And then what it means to equate them is to give a path between them along that A on the bottom. <coughs> right? So it's this heterogeneous equality like we talked about earlier. And, of course, you get the homogeneous identity type as the special case where the dimension S does not occur free in the type A. Good? Questions? There's a bracket with S around that, decorating it in. Yeah, so that just means S is a binder. And I guess I could have just put it on the A in this case. It right? just, so it could binds, just, be, just binds, just binds S in A in this case. Yeah. Oh, I so see. So it's just like... I see. It's, yeah. it's the binder for A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a, a better notation would be id s dot a, a0, a1. So you could, why not introduce find s in a as a new type, and then you could define the identity as a sigma using ordinary... We'll get there. Propositional. I, I have an answer to that, but let me show the only rule for the identity type okay. before I can say it. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, what's the intro for the identity type? To give an element of the identity type between A0 and A1, <coughs> what I need to do, right, so this is, remember, we introduced these cubes so that the identity type would sort of be going up one level in A, right? We want the identity type for A to come with A, so the identity type should be this dimension shift. To give an element of the identity type for A, what I do is I introduce a new variable, and then I don't, so like, I introduce a new variable, and then I give a cube U in A 
with one higher dimension. But I don't want just any higher cube in A. I want one whose zero side is a zero and whose one side is a one. Right? Because I want a cube that equates the things that I wanted to <coughs> equate on the bottom. Okay? So it's like this constrained lambda abstraction as you go up. And then the dimension substitution just pushes inside and we can help it convert if we need to in order to ensure that that works. Question? <coughs> yeah, think of that as definitional equality. Could you just yeah. write u 0 slash s instead of a 0 and u1 slash s instead of v1? Uh, well, you could, but then you would need Well, no, because you also have yeah, to check yeah. that you have a well-formed type, right? Because so then, like, then you get into trouble. Yeah. So I think I want to keep it so that you ask first that the type is well-formed, mm -hmm. right? So like the, we don't want the. I mean, I, I think those two rules. Yeah, no, no, I, 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 I was just saying yeah. in that. Yes, in this particular rule, you could probably can, can you remove a yes. zero and a yes. one? Yes. Yeah. I think you could, instead of referring to a zero and a one, just refer to the left side of u and the right side of u. Yeah. <coughs> and that would sort of be a synthesis rule instead of a checking rule, right? So I think of it as I'm given a zero and a one, and I want to know is this lambda an appropriate element of the identity type between a zero and a one? And for that, we kind of want to phrase it this way. Right. It, depending on the algorithmic, so the type system you would want to find. In the conversion at the bottom, the yeah. x is fresh for r, right? Yes, yes, yes. So, like, as, you know, if this s prime so, so happens to be s, then alpha convert, right? Because, like, my point is, these behave just like variables, and we know how to make variables work, and this is just substitution for variables. So, yeah. Okay. Now, the identity type of limb. If I give you an element of the identity type, then, in particular, I have given you a cube in A. So, in the case where, this is probably easiest to see, in the case where uh, R is, so suppose that psi is psi prime comma S, and I look at U at S prime, <coughs> so if I have a fresh dimension there, then what I'm saying is that, then on the bottom, what I get is that U at S prime is a cube in A that depends on an extra dimension. Okay? So, if I've given you a cube in A, right, an element of the identity type, then in particular I've given you a cube in A. This is what this rule is saying. Dan, shouldn't that be A with R for S? Um, I mean, uh, yes. 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 <laughs> yeah. Thank you. At first on the slide, I had the homogeneous one for <laughs> being, you know, yeah, so, okay. And then we'll also have beta reduction and eta expansion for the identity type, which says that, so the beta rule will say, or, sorry, first we'll have the rule that pushes the substitution inside, which just pushes the substitution inside. Then we'll have the rule that says that if I do an abstraction and then a concretization, then that reduces to the substitution. Right, so this is just like I have a lambda applied to an argument, then I substitute. And then down here, well, we could have an eta rule that says that u is the same as a lambda abstraction of an application. Okay, but there's something missing from what's on the screen, right? So in what's on the screen, all I've said is that if I give you an element of the identity type, then I've given you a higher cube but we also want to know that I've given you a higher cube with the correct endpoints. So we'll have some additional rules that say that when I instantiate a cube with zero, what I get is the left endpoint of the thing I put in. And when I instantiate a cube with one, what I get is the right endpoint of the thing I put in. 
And there's additional zero for S prime and one for S prime, which have to do with this generalized identity type. So if we just thought about the homogeneous identity type, those would go away and you wouldn't need them. And so it would just say that u at zero is a zero and u at one is a one. Okay. So these are unusual rules from the point of view of like standard Martin Lope type theory or something like that. Because it's a rule that says, based on the type of a variable, I get a definitional equality. They're not an equality reflection rule or something like that. They're very similar to the rules for the uh, singleton types in the Stone Harper singleton calculus. Right there, you have a type of x has type <coughs> I'm equal to y, and out of x having type I'm equal to y, you get a definitional equality between x and y. So this is exactly the same kind of thing, except it's sort of thinking of the identity type as a double-sided singleton. <laughs> if you have a thing in the identity type, it's something where its left side is equal to a zero, and its right side is equal to a one. Okay, there's nothing that says its left and its right side are definitionally equal, so we don't get like a quality reflection or something like that. It's just saying its left is a equal to a zero, and its right is equal to a one. Andre. So by using lots of raffles, you should be able to recover the uh, stone hacker singletons? Maybe, yeah. I thought S prime was only an A and not a little A naught. Um, yes. I think but that's actually, you substitute the Yeah, I think that's actually just a typo in a. Yeah, 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 yeah that's just be a zero. Sorry. Yeah, <coughs> that's just a typo. Sorry. Yeah. I copied the wrong thing. Okay. So, so like. Doesn't say anything. <laughs> that goes away. <laughs> that goes away. Right? So the thing I said which should go away for the homogeneous one just goes away in general. Okay. So it's kind of a good idea. <laughs> Probably not on the screen. <laughs> yeah. It should just be a zero and a one here. Yeah. yeah. The I copied the substitution from the type into the term, which is wrong. Okay. U instantiated at zero is equal to a zero. You concretized it a one yeah. is equal to a one. No, it matches what you were saying. Yeah. What? No, this matches what you were saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know. Okay. Okay. So basically, then we'll need to deploy technology for type checking a type theory where the type the definitional equality <coughs> depends on the existence of things of certain types, but. This is sort of previous work that we can rely on, and I think this will still be a decidable type system because you just kind of use the information that's in the context when you're deciding definitional equality. So it'll be a context sensitive definitional equality, but it won't be a conjecture and a decidable one. Okay? Okay, so now function extensionality. I thought we would make a nice example. So suppose I have a homotopy between f and g, and I want an element of the identity type between f and g. Well, to give that, I introduce a dimension variable by the dimension lambda, right? And give an element of A such that its left endpoint is F and its right endpoint is G. Okay? Because to inhabit the identity type, I give a higher cube that has the correct boundary. Now, what I need to do to fill in that question mark, well, how do I give something in pi type? Notice what I'm producing here is a line in pi type. It's not a point in pi type. But nonetheless, what I do is I just grab a lambda in A, which really stands for a line in A, and then give an element of B, which really stands for a line in B. And then I fill everything in with lambda x dot blah. How do I come up with, I'm oh, sorry, how do I come up with such a B? Well, I mean, follow your nose based on the types, right? I have pi x colon a dot stuff in b, and I have an x in a. So I can apply my homotopy h to x, and then eliminate the identity type at the s in order to get a line in b. And now, what is the zero side of that h of x at s? Well, it's f of x. What is the one side of h of x at s? It's g of x. 
Why is that? It's because of the rules on the previous slide, which says h of x is an element of the identity type from f of x to g of x. Therefore, h of x at 0 is the thing that it said it was proving was equal to the other thing that it said that it was proving. So using those rules, we get the correct typing for b, and then we can fill all of that in. And then to finish it off, we need to know that the boundary of lambda x h of x at s with 0 for s is f. <coughs> Notice I'm using eta there, right? So really what we're getting is the psi rule out of the uh, lambda, like the lambda is giving us congruence for lambda. And then with eta, that tells us that the zero boundary of lambda x h of x at s is lambda x dot the zero boundary of h of x at s, which is then plug in the zero, and then, well, we already just said that that was f of x. Okay, so I need lambda there. Boss? To what extent is this just to prove that if you have an interval, you get functional exchange Um. Yeah, it's basically that structure. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, basically, we don't need univalence for this now because we have the lambda abstraction over the that lets you sort of continue on into the pi type under the identity type. Yeah. Okay. We can do higher inductives. They work out really nicely in this kind of notation. So if you want the circle, then what you say is base is a constructor for the circle, loop is a constructor for the circle, given a dimension. So in particular, whenever you have a dimension variable, s is a dimension, then there's a loop in that dimension, which is a constructor for the circle. But when you substitute into base, well, the boundary of base is just base. When you substitute into loop, you push the substitution inside. <coughs> and then, what is the zero side of loop? It's base. What is the one side of loop? It's base. So you get a reduction there that tells you how the, what the boundary of the loop is. Why isn't this saying that the circle is made of many loops? Well, okay. One so, in each dimension. Because it, it's I mean, it is one, per, but if you want to give the given element of the identity type between base and base in S one, okay, then that's going to be the identity type lambda S of loops of S, and notice that this will now alpha convert. Okay, so if you look at just the elements of the identity type. They'll be independent of the choice of dimension. So but for any specific dimension, you can ask for the loop in that direction. Right? It's like saying, I can have the loop facing that way, and I can have the loop, uh, loop y, loop x facing that way. And it's just like, there's a loop in every direction. It's not many loops. It's one generic loop. Yeah. 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 It's one dimension polymorphic loop. And then the elimination rule says that if I want to construct an A, I have to do it for base, I have to do it for loop, for an arbitrary dimension. <coughs> and then, well, not only do I have to do it for loop for an arbitrary dimension, but it had better be the case that the left endpoint of that is the thing I said for base, and the right endpoint for that is the thing I said for base. Okay? And this naturally handles the induction principle for the circle, rather than just the recursion principle, because of the fact that A here can sort of, like we can substitute loop into A when we do this. <coughs> and then computation rules. The circle limb applied to the base gives you back the thing you put in. The circle limb applied to the loop gives you back the thing you put in with a substitution of S prime or S in L. If S prime is different than the stuff that's going on in L, then this will just sort of be a renaming. If S prime here is already happening in L, then this will take a diagonal. And this is exactly the diagonal you want if you've looked at examples like the construction of the Hopf vibration or something like that. There's a situation where when you apply a circle limb 
to a loop, you get a square, and then you want the diagonal of that square. And by having diagonals, we get this sort of thing. Okay, circle. Good? All right, so then we come to the hard part, which is the confilling. <laughs> Makes perfect sense, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. uh, so, <laughs> we need a notation for the confilling. Um, this is the part that's sort of the most up in the air, like, you know, we're just trying <laughs> different things. Um, so just to run through this, there's some tube dimensions, and then there's a filling dimension, and then there's a transverse space you have, and then there's sides of the tube, and a transverse space, and then some JSON compatibility, and then a tube fitting. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Let's try something. Yeah. Oh, no, that's fine. Okay. Right. Suppose the tube is empty. You have, your filling dimension is x, that is going this way across the screen, and your transverse side is 0. That's saying you have a point B, and filling that gives you a line. Okay? So if I fill in the x direction, it's saying stretch B into a line. I think this is the one that Thierry showed in his talk too, which was that this is sort of the transport of B along the line A. On the other hand, if your tube is empty, your filling dimension is x, and you have the one side that's saying you have that side, and you can fill it to a line. Uh, yeah. Where's the line? So uh, you I, can I, fill I, it I, to I, a line. I, I, yeah. I have a uh, yeah. Is there a distinct, how does it fit with diagonal? It's, well, okay. So when you do the substitution into a filling, it's not just going to be like a hit it, hit everything in sight kind of substitution. We'll get to some rules like that in a second. But yeah, so like uh, basically so when you collapse dimensions, you yeah. Yeah. So it's like, this is the sense in which the dimension substitution is like substitution, but you might need to do something else sometimes. Okay. Okay, let's look at this. Um, Two-dimensional example. So, the tube <coughs> is sort of the sides of the thing you're trying to fill, okay, in general. So, suppose you have one <coughs> dimension. That's saying you have a y is zero face and a y is one face. And then you would have your cap there, which is b, which is one side like that. If your transfer space is zero, then you would have that. And then from this u, remember that's what we started off with at the beginning of the talk, we need to fill u's, you get uh, the inside of the u, and then this bottom condition is adjacent compatibility, or sorry, tube fitting is just saying that that corner of that one is the same as that corner of that one. Okay, you need to know that the cap of the tube fits in the tube. Another thing like that is if you have the one face, then you can turn it into the whole thing, right? So it's just the symmetric thing there where I get that square. And then another thing with diagonals is for the confilling that you and I have been playing with, the idea is that if you have a diagonal that goes like that, then you can also fill hmm. that to the square. You never had the circle the second from the last of the prerequisites. That's a different. Wait, what? Yeah, no, I know. All right, yes, I agree. On the next slide. Okay. <laughs> suppose you have a tube like that, right? So suppose you have a tube in this, like, actually a tube there, right? Then the next, that missing prerequisite is the adjacent compatibility, which says that those sides of the tube line up, right? Because what I'm giving you is four faces, and I need to know that there are four faces where that edge of the top one is the same as that edge of the right one. Okay. And then from that, then the cap B, so like the thing you're given is you're given one side of the tube, perhaps the back, and then from that you get the whole square. Okay? So that's kind of the filling. I mean, the notation gets heavy, but the point is, if you think back to the beginning of the talk, we needed a way to talk about doing this in an arbitrary dimension. And if I just draw pictures like that, then, well, you know, that works for one and two, but we need a notation that works for arbitrary dimensions. Okay, and then we also have the generalized open boxes, right? So an open box might be, I just have those two sides, and then I give a cap, and then from that I get the whole box. So this is a filling where there's another dimension z in the thing you're producing. So here I'm writing the dimension <coughs> psi on the turnstile, because it made it fit better on the slide. Um, so there's an extra dimension z in what you're producing that just happens not to be mentioned in the filling term itself. 
Okay. So then we also need the composition, right? So if I fill that u to get a square, then I also get along with that the side of the square and also the diagonal of the square. And so we'll have a notation which is a con composition, which is saying that uh, I you know, take a filling and then it's sort of, you think of the con composition as the side of the filling. Right? So this is, I think, exactly isomorphic to the notation that Curie had in his talk where the coe was comp and the fill was fill. Okay, so then there's some boundary equations, right? This is one spot where the substitution doesn't act just like substitution. So if you ask for the side, a tube side of a filling, that should be the thing you put in as the tube side of that filling, right? So this is saying that the filling actually fits in the tube that you gave, and that the other side, missing side, is the composition. And then uh, uniformity would say that you push the substitution inside, and because of not doing total substitutions, there's something else that you would have to say for the diagonals here, and I'm not quite sure exactly what that is. Like I drew some pictures in dimensions one and two, and it made sense, but I'm not really sure what the notation is. You need to kind of take a diagonal of the two and then do something like that. Okay. Once we have this notation, there's really a na natural way to do this thing that we started with, which was how to define composition in the identity type, right? So I started off saying, I want to define composition in the identity type that's composing three lines. What I end up needing to do is to cap, like, fill a cube. Well, when I do a composition in the identity type with some tube t, I can tack on an extra dimension, extend the tube with the sides of the square, and then go like that. Okay? And then there's something rather natural to write for the composition in pi, which is sort of the generalization of, if you know the rule for transport for an in arrow types from the homotopy type theory book, it's sort of like you transport backwards, then you apply the function, then you transport forwards, and that kind of thing works out nicely in this sort of set. Okay, um, you also get the homogeneous identity type. Um, you can define reflexivity via de degeneracy. You can define transport via uh, the con composition. You can define single gate contractibility in terms of the con composition and the con filling. And so now we've got an identity type with REFL and J. I'm not sure about the status of the computation rule for J. So for that, you would need essentially the coe on in a type that happens not to mention s cancels, which is a different sort of equation than the ones that I've thought about, and so I'm not quite sure what happens with that. Um, I mean, Terry was saying that if you add connections, then you get that. But I think you also needed that sort of like transport in a constant being constant kind of property as well, right? Anyways, then like we haven't really done the hard part, which is the sense in which this is all still pretty much work in progress and speculative, which is figuring out how to do the fillings in phi types. I have a sense for how to state univalence, which is you state univalence and make it sort of dimension polymorphic. So it would join two cubes along a new dimension. But then we need to do the stuff that's really, I think, sort of the hardest part of this, which is defining the fillings for univalence and the fillings for type. And that's where I don't really understand the cubicle model enough to sort of translate it back into syntax. So there's definitely still a bunch of work to do. But if we have that, the idea is that this will give us a nice syntax. And I think uh, it'll be a, a language where you can program in homotopy type theory. And the programs will sort of be things that you can type check. And the intermediate states of the operational semantics will be things that you can type check. And also, I think there's room for using these higher <coughs> cubes in a lot of the synthetic homotopy theory that we've done. I think there are examples where it would be nice if I could just refer to a square rather than having to encode a square as a composite being equal to another composite. So there's examples where we've done things where having a notion of square or square over a square or cube or cube over a cube or 
hypercube over a hypercube, etc., sort of like comes up. And maybe one of these type theories where we have a notion of cube built in would be a nice way to handle these sorts of problems. Okay, so thank you. justify what we're doing without a model. I mean, I think this would be subject to standard proof theoretic tools of like proving consistency. So I think we could give an algorithm for definitional equality and then up to that proof that true is not equal to false. Definitionally. I mean, I don't know what kind of justification you want. No, because you say, okay, we haven't done five types, we need to do this and then have the hard part. Mm -hmm. But uh, you must have I mean, some criterion of success. You Kind of things randomly and, and they're beautiful. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so far I'm going on intuition and examples for, right. you know, like I want something that looks nice and works, but ultimately then we would want to sort of give a more mathematical statement of why it works, which would involve a model or some proof of some sort of consistency or you know, to, like I think there's sort of the internal con or internal correctness of, well, we can define the n-sphere in the homotopy groups of the n-sphere, right? So that means that either it's inconsistent or it's right, sort of. <laughs> so the um, in the uh, cubicle implementation, there's a composition which really simplifies things. Could you imagine having this in your syntax too? Well, so that was the coe. <laughs> so the the composition is the boundary of the filler. Like the thing I was writing coe here, or the thing that Terry was writing comp is the composition. The question is whether you can define the filler but in terms of the composition. Sorry, that's what I meant. And that's that's where the connections come in. Yep. So yeah, we can try that. I mean there's other thoughts about maybe you could define the uh, I mean, originally what I was trying was we just have the filler and we think of the composition as the sort of delayed substitution into the filler, which would be another way to simplify that. But then we have to define the filler in high types, which is exactly where I had something wrong and it, you know, I'm not sure what to do. Actually, uh, this is a good example. Uh, so these pictures, you have, uh, starting from uh, this shape, yeah. new shape, you need to have the diagonal. Yeah. And this is not very natural because. I mean, the input is uh, all the three lines, mm -hmm. but for the diagonal, you need only two lines. Right. So that's, uh, so that's why, I mean, that's another example where it's nice to produce a feeling composition. Yeah, right, right. Mm -hmm. You have an interval object. Like, in what sense? So that you could define a new primitive type such that then the error from that type gives you the identity types? Well, so like a map from the usual higher inductive interval gives you the total space of the path type. So if that's what you want, then yes. I mean, we'll, you know, we'll have the usual thing that like i arrow a is the same as sigma right. xy colon a dot it xy. So that's 
if all the trouble is caused by the identity type, maybe you can replace your trouble with the trouble of describing <laughs> the interval type. I mean, basically none of the trouble is caused by the identity type because the whole system makes sense without the identity type. Right? Okay. Like, the higher cubes in the type exist before the identity type internalizes them. So that's true. The problem is the higher fillings in all of the types. Which is, of course, motivated by the identity type. But, yeah. yeah. We spent several years looking for free lunches here, and I don't think there are any. But let's go. Okay, we're going to be one. Yes. <laughs>